the following book is called The Repentance of Judas, or The Lamentable Effects of a Startled Conscience, delivered in eight several doctrines raised from the third, fourth, and fifth verses of the 27th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. John Preston, 1634. Matthew 27, 3-5, to Then when Judas, which betrayed him, saw that he was condemned, he repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in betraying of innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to it. And when he had cast down the silver pieces in the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. These words contain the repentance of Judas after his great sin of betraying Christ. The sum of them is to show what sentence he had cast upon him. The parts of the words are these five. First, a description of Judas, one who betrayed Christ. Secondly, the occasion of his repentance, which is set forth by the circumstance of time, when he saw he was condemned. Thirdly, the repentance itself in these words, he repented himself and brought again and so on, of which repentance there are three parts. First, he made restitution of that he had taken. He brought again the thirty silver pieces. Number two, he confesses his sin, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. Number three, he shows himself sorrowful, so that if it were to do again, he would not do it, which is another effect of his repentance. Fourthly, the entertainment that he had of the chief priests and elders afterward, wherein observed first, that excuse himself, saying, What is that to us? Although they had little reason to say so, for if he had sinned in betraying Christ, then much more they who were the causes thereof. And number two, they lay more burden upon him. Look thou to it. Fifthly, the issue of all this wherein is set down, number one, what comfort he had of those thirty pieces of silver, he cast down the silver pieces. And number two, what judgment God inflicted on him, he made him his own executioner. He departed and went and hanged himself. These are the parts of the words. First, the description of Judas, one that betrayed Christ. From whence observed, the doctrine is this, that look what a man is in his lifetime, such shall be his name in the end, if their lives have been bad, their names at their death will be according. If good, their report shall be thereafter. As it is here plain in Judas, he has his name according to his desert. I don't deny, but for a time a good man may be evil spoken of, and an evil man may be magnified. For the former, we may see it in many places, our Savior Christ himself was little regarded of the scribes and Pharisees. David may for a while be despised. Paul may be reproached, and so Joseph and many others. For the second, wicked men for a while may have a good report. Judas may so carry himself for a while that none of the disciples would so much as suspect him for a traitor to his master. But behold the end of these men. It shall surely be according to their deeds. Let Jeroboam carry a fair show. Let Ahab have a good report for a while. But mark the end of these men. For Jeroboam, who mingled his own devices with the worship of God, behold, he has his brand set upon him for his perpetual infamy. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made all Israel to sin, Second Kings 10.29. And although Amaziah made a great show, yet at last was marked for an hypocrite. So Ahab at last was branded with the name of eternal disgrace. On the contrary side, good men's names shall flourish at their death, though it may be before disgraced. David, although he had committed many grievous sins, yet at the last his name was most honorable, and thus it is that verified, God blesses the righteous, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Proverbs 10, verse 7. Now to come to the reasons of this doctrine, why the Lord rewards every man in the end according to their ways in their lifetime, 
The first reason hereof is taken from God himself. He blesses and curses men's ways according to their works. Therefore needs must it be that he must bless the godly, but curse the wicked. He makes their names to rot, and rotten things soon stink. Hence it is that names of so many are so infamous after their death. And this the Lord does for two reasons. First, in regard of his truth, he cannot be corrupted. And therefore his men are indeed, so he blesses or punishes them. And although men may be deceived, yet he cannot. For he knows the way of the righteous, and the way of the wicked shall perish. Psalm 1, verse 6. Secondly, in regard of his glory, I will honor them that honor me, saith the Lord. If those that dishonor God should be honored, or if those that honor God should be dishonored, it would be an impeachment to his honor. But God is tender over his honor, and therefore by no means will he suffer it so to be. The second reason is drawn from the men themselves. Ordinarily men will be like themselves. Fainted things quickly return into their own nature. If good metal be covered over with bad, the bad will soon wear away, and the good will appear. And on the contrary side, if bad metal be covered with good, the good will soon wear away, and the bad will be seen. So a godly man may have some slips, but at the last it will appear what he is. And an hypocrite may have many a good fit, yet sooner or later he will show himself to be like himself. The third reason is taken from other men. At the end, envy ceases, and then their consciences that before did but whisper shall now speak aloud in their ears that they have been good men. On the other side, for wicked men, it may be they have been great men, and so they dare not speak as they thought. But then fear shall be removed, and then they shall use liberty of speech. For why are wicked men well spoken of in this life? but only because that men dare not speak their minds, but then, when both envy and fear shall be removed, then shall Paul be Paul, and Judas shall be Judas. Now the verses are the three. First, if men's names shall be according to their hearts in their lifetimes, then take heed that you keep not an evil heart in secret, for God who sees your sins in secret will reward you openly. God sees your secret profaneness, your secret covetousness. So accept you speedily amen, God in the end will give you a name accordingly. On the contrary, are you secretly upright, holy, and so on? God certainly sees it, and he will in the end plentifully reward thee. For if we have not credit with God, surely all glosses and shifts will do no good. So that this is true both as well for the evil as the good. Let every man therefore look to his own conscience and see how the case stands with him. Are you an hypocrite? God will even set a brand upon you as he did upon Cain, which shall never be separated from you, no more than the shadow from the body. You shall never have a good name with men. Yea, and rather than your wickedness shall be hidden, the very birds of the air shall disclose it. And although it may be you think that your power or authority will shield you from an ill report, Yet I tell you, your expectation will much be frustrated. Secondly, this said, teach us daily to renew our repentance for our sins. For although it may be our sins are remitted, yet unless we do daily by repentance cleanse our hearts, God at the length will bring us to shame. And as Joseph's brethren, who because they did not repent them of their sin against their brother, were many years after grieved and troubled for it. Therefore, as you love your names, by daily repentance make up the breaches of your heart and life. For thus did the prophet David, who would ever in the least manner have imagined that he, after his great sins of murder and adultery, would have recovered his name. Yet because that he unfeignedly, even from the bottom of his heart, repented, behold, at the last he recovers again his name, and in the end, eyes both full of riches and honors. So likewise... Job, though he was in his lifetime very impatient, be, yet because that he repented him of it truly, afterward he is honored for his patience. And hence is it that St. James saith, Remember the patience of Job, 
A good name cannot but must follow grace and virtue, no less than a sweet smell will needs follow flowers and sweet ointments. If then you have committed any sin, either in secret or openly, wilt thou have your good name recovered before you die? Be sure to make your heart sure by repentance. Thirdly, let not good men be discouraged for evil reports that they may hear have for a time, nor let not evil men be encouraged for the good reports for a time they may have. For at the last all evil reports that are cast on the godly shall vanish away, and all the good reports that the wicked have had shall quite forsake them, and every one then shall plainly appear what he is. The reason of this is because the reports of the wicked have no sure rooting. Indeed certain it is that the godly often have an ill name, Yes, most sure is it that at the last God will make their goodness to break forth as the sun when it has been long darkened. Yet here must be one caution premised that our hearts be substantially good. I don't deny, but a man may have some blemishes. But we must daily labor to keep our hearts unspotted from this world. We must behave ourselves blamelessly. But how? Not by stopping the mouths of men but we must keep ourselves unspotted of the world and arm ourselves against it by abstaining from sin. If paper be well oiled, cast ink upon it, and it will soon return off again. But if it be not oiled, it will stay on. So if our hearts be well oiled against the world by our innocent carriage, then if they have ill reports cast upon them, they will not remain but off again presently, and so again on the contrary side. And so much for the first part of my text. Number two, the time. When he saw he was condemned. Hence learn again that sins are commonly covered and glosses put upon them until they be committed. But after they are committed this sin, it seemed a matter of nothing to him. But after, behold, how heinous it is. Satan herein is very ready to deceive us, as we may see in many examples. So he dealt with David when he went to number the people. One Joab represented the sin to him well enough, yet it seemed nothing to him, but he must needs have it done. Then afterwards see how heinous it was to him, insomuch that it made him cry out, saying, I have done exceeding foolishly. But should we trace the whole Bible, we can find no better example than this of Judas. Christ had given him so many warnings, saying, One of you shall betray me. And again, I have chosen twelve, and behold, one of you is a devil. And again, it were better for that man by whom the Son of Man shall be betrayed, that he had never been born. Yet all this would not serve, but the luster of the thirty pieces of silver had so blinded his eyes that he could not see. Now, for the reasons. The first reason is taken from a man's self. Our lusts within us are so strong that we cannot see the sin as was that in Cain, for the properties of these lusts are to cast a mist before our eyes and to blindfold us thereby. As when a man does anything in his anger, while his anger lasts, he thinks that he does it with a reason, but afterwards he judges himself for it and considers the thing as it is in itself. So is it when a man is blinded with his lusts, he goes on in sin. The second reason is from the devil, who covers our sins before they are committed with some baits, for he knows no fish will bite at a bare hook. So sin at the first is covered with profit, pleasures, and so on, or else he labors to mince it with distinctions, but when it is committed, then he sets it forth in its own proper colors. The third reason is from God himself, who gives men up oftentimes in his just judgment and then use all the persuasions and reasons in the world, and you cannot move them from it. Hence is it that the Apostle speaks, Romans 1, verse 28, as they regarded not to know God, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind, that they were not able to discover or discern of the truth, which is a metaphor taken from a touchstone, which is able to discern between true gold and false. But when the virtue of this touchstone is taken away, then it cannot discern. So in like manner, when his God shall give a man up to commit sin and take away his right mind, he cannot discern evil from good, no more than a blind man can judge of colors. 
Yea, and as he is no stronger to resist any temptation than Samson was when his hair was cut off to resist his enemies. Indeed, I don't deny but that God may sometimes for sin leave good men to themselves. Thus God dealt with Ezekiah, Second Chronicle 32, verse 31, who because he had showed the ambassadors of the prince of Babylon all his furniture, it is said God left him to himself. And this is done for these two reasons. First, because God is willing to it for his own glory. Secondly, because by this their consciences come to be awakened and begin to ring a loud peal in their ears. But here we must know that there is a great difference between God's leaving of wicked men to themselves and good men to themselves. For first, for wicked men, their conscience is awakened, but not soundly until the day of death, although they may have some remorse and sorrow before. But commonly God wakes a good man sooner. The sins of a good man are either lesser or greater. If lesser, he is sooner awakened. If greater, he is awakened with greater difficulty. For a gross sin is always most dangerous. This you may see plainly in David. When he had cut off the lap of Saul's garment, he quickly perceived his sin. But when he had committed the sole sin of adultery... He was more a great deal insensible of that. The reason why we are so insensible in gross sins is this, because when a godly man commits but a little sin, for all that his heart still remains in good temper. But when he commits a great sin, then it's all out of order and cannot perceive it so soon. Even as a man, if he has a great blow on the head with a staff, he is less sensible than if he had a little scratch so is it with God's children in committing of sin. Now the application is this. Seeing that this is the devil's craftiness, first to cover sins before they are committed, let us in, when we are assaulted with any temptation, take heed. Let us not believe that that sin is little, but rather let us demur and consider a little the matter. If you have any good motions in you, execute them speedily. But if you are tempted to wickedness, stay a while and consider a while. It's the note of a fool to go on. He regards not weather, but it's the sign of a wise man to see a danger afar off and escape it. Consider what will follow your sin. At the first Judah thought that thirty pieces of silver would have made amends for all. But after he was condemned, he repented of his former folly. If before we sin we could but feel the consequences, we would never commit it. If we could but see the blindness of mind, the horror of conscience, the hardness of heart that will inseparably follow them, we would certainly shun them. For is any man so mad as to think that if he felt the sting of conscience first before he ate the sweet meat, that he would then eat it? No, surely. So could we but see the punishment now that will follow a little pleasure. Surely we would reject all the pleasure. Let us, therefore, be so wise for to look to the baits that the devil casts before us. For he is cunning and subtle, and it is good for us to think so. We usually labor and strive against evil company to abstain from them. Why should we then meddle with the devil or be in his company? Eve was drawn to sin through a conference with the devil, although it may be at the first she intended it not. Don't gaze at all upon these baits of Satan, and if he presses these things before you, consider the consequences of it that will certainly follow, and say as Jezebel said, though after another manner, had Zimri peace who flew his master. If he tempt thee to lying, then say, had Ananias and Sapphira peace who lied to the Lord? If he tempts you to other sins, look what the scripture saith against such sins. As If he entice you to commit fornication, remember that of the apostle, commit not fornication as some did, whereof died three and twenty thousand. Or say thus, had Onan peace, who sinned in thus doing? Does he entice you to drunkenness? Say with yourself, had Nabal peace, who died not for his churlishness? but for his drunkenness. So for any sin in general, does he entice you to it, 
Look to the plain words of the Bible, for there is no sin without bitterness. But now to the intent we may the better be able to avoid his base, let us consider the deceits and glosses which he uses to put before us, which are these. His first deceit is that he seldom tempts one to the committing of one of the least sins, but he promises either profit, pleasure, or some reward. Now to this I answer first, here consider, if you do not deprive yourself of a great pleasure, even of the pleasure of a good conscience, surely that will bring more joy and comfort than any earthly thing can, yea, and at last more advantage in outward things than sin. Secondly, when he tells you of his profit and pleasure, tell him that he cannot be as good as his word, for the pleasures of sin are but for a season, and in the midst of these pleasures there is grief. Now there is a double misery in every sin. First, that which is an inherit, which is the sin itself. The mind can never take contentment till it have the proper object, and everything takes pleasure when it is as it should be, otherwise it does not. But as a leg or an arm being out of joint is full of pain and grief, so when the mind and faculties thereof are distracted, they were, as it were, out of joint and full of grief. The pleasures of the wicked have sorrow with them, but the sorrows of the godly have joy. Secondly, as to good actions, there is pleasure a joint. So there are also some wills which follow every sin. Satan, he presents before our eyes fair pleasures when he tempts us to heinous sins, but he never shows us the pain and grief that will follow. So he did with our Savior when he tempted him, showing him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, but never did he show him the grief. Thus likewise did he when he tempted the Israelites, showing them the flesh pots in Egypt and their onions and so on, but he never showed them the grievous pain and servitude that there, in making bricks, they did undergo. His second deceit is this. He tells us that though we sin, yet we may escape and go to heaven notwithstanding. I answer, do but remember what God saith to this temptation, Deuteronomy 29, verse 19, when he shall hear the words of this curse, if he shall bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, although I walk according to the stubbornness of my own heart, Though I commit such and such sins, yet notwithstanding I shall go to heaven. But mark what God says. I will not be merciful to that man, but my wrath and my jealousy shall smoke against him. Every curse that is written in this book shall light upon him, and his name shall be rooted out from under heaven. The next doctrine, that there is a marvelous aptness in the nature of man to excuse a sin when he has committed it. The Pharisees here were the men that moved and hired Judas to betray Christ. Judas was but the instrument they used, and they had purposed to have him put to death. Although Judas had never betrayed him, yet they say, What is that to us? Thus also Adam, having done that that was directly contrary to God's command, yet excuses himself. Thus did the king of Israel, as Esau, when he had committed an evident sin, he would not acknowledge it, but when the prophet comes to tell him of it, he falls a threatening of him. Thus also did Amaziah. First, because all sin, after it is committed, leaves a blot in the mind, which is compared to a shadow, which darkens the mind, so that it cannot see. For that, that the apostle says of hatred, First John 2 verse 9, that such an one as hates his brother lives in darkness. The same may be said of all other sins. Secondly, because actual sins increase a passion which at the first made us commit it. Now the stronger the passions are, the more is the judgment corrupted. Thirdly, because sin works on those faculties which should judge, it weakens the judgment, and is like a blow on the head that takes away all sense. Fourthly, because actual sin grieves the Holy Ghost and makes him depart and it is he only that convinces us of sin. And therefore, how can we see when he is gone that enlightens us? And when this Holy Spirit is gone, then in comes the evil spirit which puts into us false reasons, and so we by them excuse ourselves. 
The application is first, therefore, to let us take heed of declining from God and falling into any sin, seeing it so difficult a thing to get out of it again. What makes us to recover but a sight of our sins? Now falling into sin blinds our eyes, wherefore it must needs be very hard to recover. Sin then it's so hard to recover, take heed of first falling into sin. For a man that is a little fallen into sin is like a man in a quicksand, ready to sink deeper and deeper. Suppose a man does pollute God's Sabbaths. At the first there is sorrow for it. Afterward he begins to do it more and more, but at last he does it with delight. What is said of uncleanness is true of all sins, Proverbs 30, verse 20. She wipes her mouth, and so on. She excuses herself, so that although she must needs confess it to be a sin, yet in that case she accounts it none. Secondly, if you are fallen into any sin, remember your aptness to excuse it, and labor to get out as soon as you can. Number one, remember what your judgment was of that sin before you fell into it, although now you judge it small. The judgment is like a glass. Before it is cracked, it shows true, but after it is cracked, it represents things otherwise than they are. Think with yourself, therefore, how ill once you thought that sin, and seeing your own judgment is blinded, help yourself with other holy men's judgments concerning that sin. Number two, labor to abstain from the acting of that sin, and so will light come in again by a little and a little, and then you will see the ugliness of it. For no man sees the ugliness of a sin until he first comes out of it. And now we come to their answer. What is that to us? Look thou to it. From hence again learn this doctrine, that for the most part, in a time of our extremity, we have least comfort from those which were our companions in evil. Judas here comes to the high priests, which were his companions in the betraying of Christ. But they gave him poor comfort. What have we to do with that? Look thou to it. Miserable comforters to a man in his extremity. Now the reasons are taken first from God's justice. It is just with God when men join against him to set them one against another. So he set Abimelech and the men of Shechem, one against another. God sends an evil spirit between them. He can make enemies to be friends and friends to be enemies. There are abundance of such examples in histories. Secondly, from man's nature, which is apt to love the treason and hate the traitor, he has a love to the lust, and so may love the treason. He has a principle in him to hate the traitor. Thirdly, from the nature of their love, it's for commodity or gain, or some by, end, or other. And therefore, when the commodity ceases, that also ceases. Yea, and often turns to hatred, as Ammon's love to Tamar did. This should teach us to take heed how we join with men to do evil. It is better to join to their consciences in doing well, for their consciences will continue then to their lusts. For they will end, and then their love to you will end also. Hence it is said in the Proverbs, that he that reproves shall find more favor in the end than he that flatters. Many rejoice in the love of evil company, but all that love is but like glass soldered together. When God sends the fire, as he did to Abimelech, to melt that, they fall asunder and all their love ceases. Now the next thing is, he cast down the thirty pieces of silver. And here the doctrine is this, that the thing that is the greatest comfort when God turns his hand against us proves most discomfortable. Judas here thought the thirty pieces of silver a great manner. But when once God moved his conscience, he casts them away. So suppose a man get favor, honor, riches, or any other thing naughtily, it will prove but a trouble, number one, from the curse of God. Although the thing in itself be good, yet God ever mixes some evil with it, which makes it bitter. Stolen bread is sweet, but God fills the mouth with gravel. 
O misery, with God's favor, is most sweet, is Paul's imprisonments and whippings, and Joseph's. But on the contrary side, all pleasure with God's displeasure is bitter. Number two, because sin makes the soul sick. And then it's never well until it casts up. And thus Judas, the thirty pieces burdening his soul, must cast them up. Many go on in sin and are never troubled. As in our bodies, though there be ill humors, yet they don't make a man sick until they are stirred. So sin does not until God stirs it, as here he did in Judas, and then it makes us sick. This should therefore move men to take heed how they turn sail for their own advantage. Suppose by going from God you get what you would, yet God can make that comfort to prove but a burden unto you, as he did Judas, his thirty silver pieces. Be therefore content to lose all before you lose God. Now follows the event of all, he went and hanged himself. Whence learn that God's wrath and sin are exceeding terrible and unsupportable when they are once charged on the conscience. This made Judas to hang himself. Do but a little consider man's nature, how loath to destroy himself, how afraid to die, and you shall find it to be some great manner that must cause him to make an end of himself, and to cast himself into that which he feared, namely, hell. Thus heavy is sin when God once charges it on the conscience that makes a man do all this. Indeed, sin was as heavy as before, but then it lay at our foot, and we felt it not. But when God lays it once on our shoulders and on our consciences, then shall we feel the burden of it to be far beyond all torments that can be imagined. See this in Christ, when God did but charge our sins on him. How intolerable were they! Now for the better understanding of this point, I will first show you what this horror of conscience is which I will do by explaining these five questions following. By what means is this horror of conscience wrought? Two ways, sometimes by God's own spirit, sometimes by Satan. First, it's done by God's own spirit, when by it the mind is enlightened to see that he is in bondage by reason of sin. Hence it is that it is called the spirit of bondage, Romans 8, 15. Secondly, and more frequently by Satan, when he, by God's permission, vexes and terrifies the souls of man, and drives them to despair. And this is called horror and the vexing of the soul. Now, whether this horror of conscience be wrought by God's own spirit, or by Satan, we may know by these four differences. Number one, if we find any falsehood mingled with this trouble of conscience, then it comes from the devil for the Holy Ghost mingles no falsehood, but only enlightens and shows the truth. Light makes a thing seem as it is. Number two, you may discern of it by the affection it strikes in us, for that, that the devil causes in us strike in a hatred of God, but that, that God's Spirit works in us, causing a servile fear. Number three, you may know it by the extremity of anguish it causes. God's spirit works by meekness and consolation, but the devil works by extremity of terror and fear. Number four, you may know it by the manner of doing, for the devil does it disorderly, suddenly and violently, without any equality. But the spirit proceeds orderly. First it enlightens the mind, and then it raises objections. And so goes on by a little and little. But the devil works violently. Hence it is that Satan is said to buffet Paul. For all buffeting betokens violence. What is to be thought of such a condition? I answer that such a condition being simply in itself considered is very miserable because it estranges and draws a heart away from God, yea, and from Christ, who is the end of God's works. And so, therefore, must needs be a most heinous sin. But yet, as God uses it, it is a sign, or one of the first steps to faith, and a good means to subdue and weaken the stubbornness of our hearts. Question. 
How may we know whether God intends this for a punishment or for a preparation of grace? Answer. You may know it by the event. For when God does it, for the salvation of the creature, then after it there follows grace. But if it brings not grace after it, if there be only a plowing and no harvest, the pricking with a needle and no thread, then it's a spark of hell fire, and a very precluder of hell. What shall we then think of those that never had this horror and trouble of conscience? Their estate for all that may be very good, for this vexation is not absolutely needful, although humiliation is. Therefore, if you have it not, seek not after it, for God uses many means. Yet you may take hence occasion the more to try your state. Next question. Whether comes this horror from melancholy, or how shall we discern it from melancholy? If he apprehends sin and the wrath of God, then it is a horror of conscience. For when the faculty is pitched upon the right object, to wit, sin, then it is no melancholy. But in horror, the conscience is pitched upon the right object, namely sin. For that is a proper object of the conscience. As for melancholy, that is not grief, but extends grief. As varnish is not color, but does extend the color. Indeed, melancholy may be joined with it, and draw it forth, but it comes not wholly from that, but from the other inward principle. As the fatness of the soil may bring forth the corn the sooner, but yet that is not the cause of it, but the root that it has. Again I answer that all diseases are healed by their contraries. If that this were melancholy, then might it be healed by merry company, which is the contrary to it. But if it be the whore of conscience, then it must be healed by the apprehension of God's love in Jesus Christ. Whether may it befall the child of God to be in this case after he is in the estate of grace or not, I answer that this extremity of horror which Judas here tasted of never befalls the child of God after he is in the state of grace. And my reason is this, because that is perfect love casts out all fear. So where this is some love left, there is no perfect fear. Indeed, God's children are never holy without fear, Romans 8. Yet in their greatest fear there is in them the root of comfort remaining. There are many examples that may be brought to prove this, but I know none like that of our Savior Jesus Christ, who although he was in such an unspeakable horror of conscience that it made him cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yet this horror was mingled with faith, comfort, and the assurance of God's favor. So God's children may have such sorrow, and be so drunken with wormwood, that it may make them not to know what to do. Yet in all this grief, the fire of God's love is not quite extinguished, but there are some sparks thereof remaining under the leashes. Here is a caveat to be given of two things first. Let those that are in this disposition of mind take heed of that, that Satan in this condition may labor to bring us to, for then they are in a disease, and those that are in a disease incline to some thing. Take heed then of polluting the Sabbath and other sins, that he may entice you to. Secondly, something must be done positively for the healing of our grief, when that we are in sorrow. We must pitch upon the proper object to wit sin, and put away all worldly sorrow, for that brings death, but sorrow for sin, that brings life. All these things thus being expounded, the point is manifest, that sin and God's wrath being charged on the conscience are exceedingly terrible. Indeed, when the burden lies on the ground, we don't feel it, but when it lies on our shoulders. So before this horror is charged on the conscience, we don't feel it, but then it is exceedingly terrible when it is applied. It is with grief as it is with joy. There are three things in all joy. Number one, there is a good thing. Number two, there is a conjunction of that good thing to us. And number three, a reflect knowledge thereof. So also in grief, there are three things. Number one, there is a bad thing. Number two, there is conjunction of that to us. And number three, the reflecting of the understanding in which we know the hurt that comes to us by it. When a man feels and sees and knows his sin, 
then it is unsupportable. And the reason thereof is because that then a man's spirit is wounded and cannot bear itself. The reasons of this are three. First, because the sin and God's wrath are in themselves the greatest evil, as righteousness and God's favor are the greatest good. Men may think that punishment was the greatest evil, but it is not, for that is but the effect of sin. Sin is the cause thereof. Now we know that the cause is always greater than the effect. Now when God shall open our eyes to see this sin and God's wrath, then it will be an insupportable burden. This is the reason that at the day of judgment the wicked shall cry to the hills and mountains to fall on them, to hide them from the presence of the judge, because that then God shall open their eyes to see their sins, which if he should do now while they are here on earth, would make them cry out as much. As it is with comfort, so it is with grief. If we know not of it, it affects us not. As the army that was about Gehazi, it comforted not him, because he didn't see it. So for grief, although hell and damnation be about us, yet we don't see it, we do not regard it. The second reason is taken from God's manner of working on the spirit of the creature. He then leaves it. Now we are to know that the greatest comfort the creature has is the fruition of God's presence, and the greatest grief is his absence. If we want that, we are deprived of all comfort. As if the sun be absent, we are deprived of all light. If these were but a little comfort remaining, that would serve to hold the head above the water. But if all comfort is gone, it then presently sinks. The proper object of fear and grief is the absence of good, and presence of evil in both of them come by the privation of God's presence. The third reason is taken from the nature of conscience itself, when it is awakened, because that then it is sensible of the least sin. For every faculty, as it is larger, so it is more capable of joy and grief. Therefore, men are said to be more capable of joy and grief than the brute beasts, and in man the soul is more capable than the body, and in the soul conscience of all other parts most capable. And as the conscience is capable of the greatest grief, so also of the greatest comfort, it is capable of the peace of God which passes all understanding. And surely this whore of conscience is nothing else but a spark of hell fire, which the heathen had some inkling of when they said they were exaggerated with the furies. Seeing then that the wrath of God is thus insupportable, this should teach us in all things especially to labor to keep a good conscience, and to labor to be free from the guilt of sin. If the wrath of God be the greatest evil, then should the whole stream of our endeavors be to take heed thereof, by laboring for to keep a pure conscience. Proportion your care herein to the good that will come thereby. It will bring the unspeakable comfort. Without this labor to keep a good conscience, you will never have your heart perfect. Therefore labor for it. Consider the good it brings. Men busy themselves here to the utmost for other things, as for learning, credit, riches, and honor, and all because they think that they are worthy their labors. Let us then but consider the fruit that this piece of conscience will bring. Let us but gather up our thoughts that are busied so much about other things, and but consider this a little, which if men would but do, they would spend more time about it than they do. For now these things are done, but by the by, and have not that tithe of the time spent about them that should be, which we spend about other things. But let such know that it is but a folly to go about that work with a finger which requires the strength of the whole body. When this work of the building of grace requires the whole strength of a man, and we put not our whole strength thereto, it is no marvel if we do not prosper therein. Let us therefore seriously consider our ways. Let us consider with what temptations the devil daily assays us. Consider that it were as good get ground of the raging sea or of raging lusts. Consider these things with yourself. I am verily persuaded that the chiefest cause why there is so much deadness in those that belong to Christ is because they consider not their ways. Take time, therefore, to consider your ways. It is no wonder to see men complaining of their weakness when as they will not labor to keep a good conscience. 
It is all one as if a sluggard should complain of his poverty, or an idle scholar should complain of his ignorance. Be exhorted, therefore, to prize a peace of conscience, spend the chiefest of your cares for it. For if you lose some few other things, so you get that, they are all nothing in comparison to that. But the common fashion now is to spend but a little time in such things as these are, and so think that enough too. This shows us a miserable condition of those that still lie in their sins. It may be they think the burden of it to be light and don't account it, but when the burden of their sins shall be laid upon them, they will find it to be intolerable. Now, while the burden lies not on their shoulders, they don't feel it. But when God shall say, let him bear the burden of his sins, we shall find them to be unsupportable, even able to press us down to hell, as here they did Judas. The common fashion of men is not to regard what sin they run into for the escaping of some outward cross, thinking that to be the greater, but they shall one day, to their cost, find the contrary, that these outward punishments and losses are nothing in comparison to the inward. That is, outward cold and heat is nothing to the inward, the heat in summer is nothing to the heat of the fever, so that these outward crosses are but as the heat in summer, inward, like the heat of the fever. But it is a wonderful thing to see how men like little children rejoice and tremble at appearances. Children cry not at things to be feared, but at things not to be feared, as hobgoblins and the like, they cry. So do men most commonly fear those things that are but outward evils, like the scabbard without the sword, which cannot cut. They are only inward evils, which are like a deep pit out of which we cannot be recovered. Set your hearts, therefore, in a right disposition of judging of sin, that you may judge aright thereof as it is in itself. Labor to apprehend God's wrath for sin, and beat down those lusts that like mists hinder us from the sight thereof. Judge of sin as the scripture judges of it, for that is a true glass. Judge of these outward things as they are. See how you should judge of them in the day of death, and so judge of them now, and by this means you shall foresee the plague and prevent it. Seeing then that sin is so unsupportable when once it is charged upon the conscience, this should teach us earnestly to sue for pardon for it above all other things if we mean to have it. It has now become the fashion of the world to pray for the pardon of their sin in a superficial manner, but such shall never obtain it, but only those that are fervent in prayer for it. For God will be glorified of every man, both of the unjust and just. For the wicked he will be glorified of them at the day of judgment in their destruction. This is the meaning of that place in Revelation 1 verse 7. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Seek therefore the pardon of your sins. If you did but feel the burden of it a while, as Judas did, you would, if you cannot see your sins, labor to see them. And this is John Preston, a book called The Repentance of Judas, written in 1634.